Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Corey DiBiase with the National Veterans Technical Assistance Center. Very happy to be with you today and very happy to be joined by our friends at the, uh, the LEAD Center, the WIOA Center, who are here to continue the conversation they started last week on uh, issues related to discovery and customized employment. So very happy to have Nancy and Rebecca with us, uh, excuse me, Nancy and Rebecca with us. Um, and we'll be uh, getting to them in just a moment. Uh, wanted to, in addition to welcoming everyone and thank you, thanking you for joining, just wanted to do our, our typical housekeeping here. Um, you can, for folks who would like to have, uh, to kind of personalize that captioning function, you can uh, use that link and do that directly. That will create a, a second captioning box that you can control the, the text of and the sizing of and all that kind of stuff. Otherwise, it will remain as it is on the bottom of folks' screens. Um, you can also, and uh, you're not seeing our typical graphic for this, but as folks who have joined our webinars in the past know, we very much enjoy a nice interactive session. So uh, please feel free to use your question box. Uh, you can do that when you're responding to questions from the presenters, or just if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you have an observation, we'll be monitoring that. We always uh, love that kind of input. You also can raise your hands and um, uh, we and uh, we will unmute your line. And uh, we love to have folks on the line like that as well. So please feel free if you have a, a longer comment you'd like to make or a longer question, or if you'd uh, just like to say hello to everybody, please raise your hand and uh, let us know. We would love to, to hear from you in that, uh, in that way. That would be great. Um, and then, uh, and of, uh, of, of course, uh, there will also be a, a poll as we go through, but uh, that, that will pop up when the time comes and folks can interact with that. So without further ado, and uh, uh, folks on the Lead Center side, Caleb, if I've missed anything in terms of the housekeeping, please let me know. But uh, otherwise, I will hand it over to Rose Warner from the Office of Disability Employment Policy at DOL. Thanks, Corey. Good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Thank you for being on today's webinar. Uh, as you could probably infer, uh, this is a part two from last week's webinar about guided group discovery and customized employment. So the speakers probably look familiar to you. It's uh, Rebecca Ceylon and Nancy Boudot. Uh, as a reminder, uh, I'm Rose Warner and I'm a policy advisor at the Office of Disability Employment Policy and we fund the WIOA uh, Policy Development Center, also known as the LEAD Center, which is where Nancy and Rebecca are from. So at the end of this webinar, you will see some resource slides. And my job today is to give you an introduction to some of those resources you will see. Um, so first is the Customized Employment Works for Veterans Brief. This is a short uh, seven or eight page brief highlighting five veterans with disabilities who obtained competitive integrated employment through using um, customized employment. So they're just short little one pagers, very fun to read. And that document should be posted by the end of this week. So we're really looking forward to that. The other two resources I'm gonna highlight for you uh, may take a little longer to get um, posted uh, because these are videos. And these are videos telling the stories of three veterans, or sorry, two veterans um, who have obtained competitive integrated employment through just discovery and customized employment. So these videos kind of are a short introduction to discovery and customized employment. They'll be a good review for you um, but one of the people highlighted actually was able to get a job with a triple A baseball team, and he ended up becoming their official scorer, um, just thanks to the hard work of his, his job developer. So um, whenever those uh, videos get posted, I think we're close, you know, we're in the home stretch, uh, just doing sort of some 508 stuff, making sure they're captioned and everything else, um, finishing touches only. Uh, um, and I'm sure Corey will alert you as soon as they are posted, but just wanted to sort of give you a um, brief preview of those resources. So anyway, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Rebecca and Nancy to present uh, part two of Discovery and Customized Employment. 
Thanks so much, Rose. And this is Rebecca Ceylon. I'm very happy to be back again. Um, I'm hoping that most of you were on the session last week. So in last week's session, we focused on the discovery process, including guided group discovery. And as you will recall, discovery is the first step in any approach to customized employment. And now we want to take you deeper into the process of customizing employment for a job seeker. So in this session, you'll gain an understanding of the entire customized employment process and learn about the benefits of customized employment to employers We also will explore approaches to customized employment that can assist veterans seeking employment in achieving an employment outcome and provide you with access to resources on customized employment, some of which Rose has already previewed, which is great. So why is customized employment relevant for veterans, especially those with barriers to employment? Some of the answers to that question are obvious. Veterans want to live their lives like anyone else with supports if needed, and especially for the veterans with whom you all work. They want opportunities to take back control over their lives. Veterans also want ownership of their job search process. They want quality services and supports that support the fact that they're in charge of their job search process and their progress. They want economic and community reintegration. Employment affords them the opportunity to become economically self-sufficient and to play a meaningful and valued role in their community. And meaningful and valued are important words. Only the veteran themselves can determine what's meaningful to them and what's valued. As we discussed last week, some of that will come out of the discovery process they can answer questions like, what are my interests? When am I at my best? What are the things that I never tire of doing? What conditions need to be in place for me to be successful? And so on. And if you missed the last session on discovery, it's archived along with a transcript and the slide deck. So um, if you wanted more information, that's available to you. So employment is the key to this vision. Supporting people to work in customized employment opportunities is critical to enabling veterans to continue to make essential contributions. And this is key to their vision of having a good life and of economic reintegration, community integration. So essential contributions, again, would be critically important to, to veterans. Prolonged homelessness can create a negative spiral where it's continually reinforced that we aren't making or perhaps can no longer make contributions. And that mindset can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Our experiences of homelessness reinforce those negative predictions that we might have about ourselves. Customized employment and guided group discovery create momentum in the opposite direction. Guided group discovery can be motivating for veterans as it recognizes and documents the skills, gifts, and contributions people have to offer and reinforces that there are employers who need what they have to offer. If you'll remember from the last session, we talked about the beliefs and values that underpin the discovery and customized employment process. And I wanna revisit two of those beliefs. One is that at each stage of the process, that it supports the premise that there are unlimited ways to make a living in the world, and that there's a place for everyone to make a contribution and earn a living. And the other is that all people should be viewed as employable and able to make a contribution to the economic well being of a business. Supporting people to work through customized employment is critical to facilitating relationships with people outside of the military. As you'll recall, the discovery process assists people in identifying and building a network which will help veterans with barriers to employment to access the greater community, which in turn can open doors to employment. The process assists people in building new skills and assists them in recognizing ways that their skills may be valued by an employer, all of which improves self-esteem. In the last session, Nancy gave examples of a networking pitch that people develop as part of guided group discovery. 
being able to promote yourself and your skills to a potential employer is a skill in and of itself that supports this and certainly builds self-esteem. And it goes without saying that employment helps veterans have a stable financial future, which also leads to housing stability. So employment and this planning process pulls people in a positive direction that empowers them to take control of their employment future. So now we have a polling question um, that I think will be pulled up. And the question is, is what you do every day the same as what is in your job description? And you'll have three possible answers to that. So is what you do every day the same as what is in your job description? The first answer is yes, exactly. The second is mostly. And the third is I don't recall or don't know where to find my job description. Um, for those of you who may be in your position for a long time. And uh, so we'll give you a few minutes to respond to the poll. Rebecca, looks like we have about 80% of folks have uh, have answered the poll. That Should I keep good. it open or? Um, no, I, I think that probably people who have access to it uh, probably have responded. Sounds good. So I will close that up. Okay, so hey. about a quarter of people say yes, what they do every day is exactly what's in their job description. And three quarters say mostly what what's uh, what they do every day is what's in their job description, and I think that's how I would have answered that also. That uh, that most of what I do, but then there's always things and ways in which my job has been customized that you know are in the that other duties as assigned category that uh, that we all have in our in our job descriptions. So thank you for that. So we have another question that we'd like to ask you related to, to barriers that veterans face. And th for this one, we'd like you to raise your hand so that you can be unmuted to respond if, if you're comfortable doing that, or if not, to put your response into the questions box. Um, but what are some of the vet barriers that the veterans that you support face in identifying employment opportunities, applying for jobs, and or retaining employment. What are some of those barriers that you think are, are salient in their lives? And I don't think I can see the question box, so I will sure. leave that so to I'll, I'll let you know as, as uh, things come in. We've got a couple so far. Uh, Angela points out that housing, of course, uh, the need for housing and uh, uh, is is certainly um, certainly an uh, an issue for folks that folks are facing. Uh, Gabriel points out that uh, lack of recent work history is is very common for mm -hmm. folks. Um, uh, Luke points out that both age and uh, lack of training can can serve as barriers to folks. Now those are all those are all important barriers. And let's see. Um, Charles points out uh, the. Pa uh, past criminal history, a felony, uh, or even a license suspension, uh, things to that effect, um, certainly something that a lot of folks are facing. Uh, social support, lack of social support, David points out, is is a big piece of the puzzle for folks. Yes. And, and Rebecca, just uh, I'll uh, I, I chime in if, if I can as well. We've certainly been talking a lot through the course of this entire series about um, a, a challenge that, that is experienced in the, the process that points to, uh, the, in many cases, a number of the barriers that veterans are experiencing. Um, it can be challenging sometimes just to maintain engagement uh, with folks for a wide variety of reasons. Uh, so it, just that, that part of the process can, that, that sort of a challenge that can crop up for, for both sides, both the uh, HVRP staff and the veterans they're serving. Now, I think that that those are all, you know, just really important things to to note, and certainly very real challenges and barriers. And 
one of the things that that I, you know I think that we've found is exciting about customized employment is that you really can find that job match where some of those issues become less of an issue so that if someone you know does have trouble always looking well put together and smelling good and and those kinds of things there are workplaces where that's less of an issue and and if that's going to be an issue for them initially then then that's not a bad match you know there there could be something where the person could still make their contribution and and um and be a good fit um there are all kinds of skills that people can provide to to an employer that will benefit the employer that can work around some of the challenges that people that people may be experiencing um so you know and i think we'll we'll talk a bit more about that as we as we proceed so we can move on to the next slide so traditionally what we've done in approaching job development from a labor market approach is is to focus on the needs of employers with applicants who are qualified to meet those general needs what we've learned through discovery is that the traditional labor market approach puts individuals in situations where their skills are compared to a set job description. In discovery, we veer away from fixed job descriptions. And as we have seen you know, from the poll that we just did, not everyone does exactly what's on their job description. So it's not a lot to, to ask to, uh, to be able to do that. In customized job development, we discover the strengths, needs, and interests of applicants and negotiate a job description that meets the needs of both the applicants and the employer. But, but what about the labor market? Labor market information is useful to know. Um, it's useful to know where the high growth and high demand industries are in your area, which employers are hiring and growing, what positions have high turnover, for which there are pretty much always openings and, and so on. So labor market information has its place in the job development sphere as well. But customized employment rethinks traditional methods. In many cases, we circumvent HR functions. So circumventing the HR functions can be important because the typical application and interview process is really a means of excluding people with barriers to employment that may include people with disabilities who usually don't do well in this competitive system. Connecting with employers, business owners, and managers directly often works best and is easier in small businesses that dominate our communities. And there are about 33 million businesses with fewer than 20 employees in the United States and many fewer that are the large businesses. So being able to showcase an individual's skills and their abilities can open the door to a customized position. The other thing to remember on the next slide is that employers are always hiring. They hire people with similar interests, values, and especially people who can generate profits. Being able to highlight skills, and the ability to learn new skills are critical to job creation. Remember from our discussion from last week about the ways that discovery can highlight the skills, contributions, experiences, and positive personality traits that a veteran can offer to an employer. We also talked last week about vocational themes, which are not job descriptions, but rather an overarching set of interests that contain many possible jobs. Connecting employers with veterans who share similar themes is one way to make a personal and or professional connection. And we also talked about identifying three themes with a person that reflect their interests and skills. Combining things, themes also can strengthen their job development efforts and add more options to the job search. So for example, someone may have had the themes of transportation and art as two areas that, that a lot of their skills and interests clustered under. And if you think about transportation, I'm sure that a ton of different jobs 
can, can come to mind. And similarly, if you think of art, it evokes lots of different possibilities. Combining them could lead to a job where there's an intersection. So it could be, you know, auto painting and detailing and customizing. It could be something in advertising or transportation design or other things that might combine their interest in transportation and their, their skill at art. But let's talk more about the labor market. Businesses are everywhere, and despite what people say, businesses are hiring all the time. However, hiring is always guided by the premise that a new employee will improve the business, thereby improving revenue. Sometimes, regardless of labor market information, an informational interview could change everything and open a door in a business that did not even have an open position or that had advertised something else, but were able to be convinced that something else would better meet their needs. So it's not an either or with labor market information and customized employment. You don't have to pick a single approach. We're not just reacting to the labor market. We're working with the labor market and we're in some cases creating a labor market by negotiating positions. It's important to note that economic growth and recession do not seem to affect or change the employment rate when implementing customized employment. So again, employers are always hiring and there are always opportunities to customize jobs. And we should not discount small businesses. According to the Small Business Administration, small companies create 1.5 million jobs annually and account for 64% of new jobs created in the United States. We also all have experience with standard vocational assessments. This slide illustrates the conventional ways that assessments and vocational evaluations have been done. At the top of the funnel are bits, multiple bits of information that are learned through norm reference tests and standardized approaches. The results of these are funneled down to typically three vocational goals. And those are typically stated in the form of job titles or industries that can be found in the Dictionary of Occupational Titles or something like that. Discovery flips the funnel. It starts with the basic question of who are you? In other words, the first objective is to learn as much as possible about the individual job seeker, as we described previously when we discussed discovery, and then take that information to uncover almost limitless possibilities. One distinction might be that the conventional methods are an effort to be certain or to narrow the field, to narrow the funnel down, whereas the discovery approach leads to many, many possibilities based on the themes that are identified. So before Nancy takes you through the other pieces of the customized employment process, I wanna leave you with two rules to support customized employment. The first is that the focus must always be on the veteran with the veteran in control. And the second is to never break rule number one. Nancy? Thanks, Rebecca. Excellent information. All right, so let's see. What is a customized job? Basically, it's a set of tasks that differ from a standard job description, but are still based on tasks that are found and needed within that workplace. So let's clarify that a little bit more on the next slide. So a customized job may include a subset of the tasks from a job description or a mix of tasks possibly taken from several job descriptions. It may also include new tasks uh, that fills an employer's need that maybe weren't even identified um, prior to the customization process. Um, and that, you know, those identified, whether it be new or from uh, several different job descriptions, um, can sometimes lead to uh, a new customized job description. So negotiation strategies for customized job descriptions um, can include things like job carving, job creation, 
uh, or other job development or restructuring strategies. And we're going to cover all of these um, as we move along through the, the presentation and also give you some, some examples. So customized employment assumes the provision of reasonable accommodation and supports. So whenever we are thinking about customizing a job, um, we also want to think of, you know, whatever might be necessary for the individual to perform the functions of that negotiated job. So as we talked about briefly last week, um, that could be negotiations for certain types of accommodations. And at what point in the customized employment process is the employer involved? Well, obviously the employer is a big part of this, right? <laughs> They're the person doing the hiring. Um, so, so when do we involve the employer? It depends, but usually it's after we've identified the interests, skills, talents, abilities, and conditions. So the things that you uncovered during the discovery process that um, Rebecca was talking about earlier and during the process that we talked about last week. Then a team approach is utilized to develop an employment plan. And most likely that includes the employer, certainly the, the veteran job seeker, um, as well as you as the employment professional. And, and then from there, we kind of go into negotiation. So we negotiate the individualized job um, in a way that meets the employment needs of the applicant and the business needs of the employer. So it's gotta be that win-win. Um, and it's always important to remember that participation in this process um, by the employer is always voluntary, really by everybody. Right. Certainly the job seeker at well, as well. Um, this is always a voluntary process. So I want to talk to you now about some examples of customized employment. So this is an example from um, uh, an, an owner of a welding shop. So we have um, a situation here where a veteran was a welder, but could no longer do that specific job but still wants to somehow work in the industry, still would like to maybe be in a welding shop, be in a machine shop, that type of thing. So in this situation, a customized job description was used where after several meetings with the employer, we looked at some of the tasks that needed to take place in that welding shop. So we look at what, what, what tasks are happening successfully, um, and then is there an element of any of the duties or responsibilities which you know, aren't being met, aren't being completed for whatever reason. So there are times that there, um, I'm sorry, this is where customized employment can really be considered a reasonable adjustment. It may be that the candidate is capable of, co of completing a high percentage of certain tasks, but maybe not all of the tasks. Um, so on your screen in this example, when we met with the employer, um, some of the things that weren't getting done, um, gathering up the blueprints. So that was something that was either supposed to be done by the night shift, if any of you have worked shift work, you know that sometimes the peer person before you <laughs> on the last shift doesn't necessarily leave things for you the way they're supposed to. Um, so what the welders were doing, were going to get like kind of like one blueprint at, at, at a time and bringing it back to their workstation. So going to set up stations, that also meant that their stations weren't set up for the day, right? They were only set up per project and sometimes they worked on several projects a day. Also, and very important for the owner of this shop is the accounting wasn't getting done in a way that he liked um, it to get done. He wanted to do it himself, but he was too busy doing a lot of the tasks that the welders weren't doing for whatever reason. Um, inventory was getting done, eh, maybe, sometimes yes, sometimes no, and the same with restocking supplies. 
So we talked to that employer about kind of a welding support position. <coughs> so excuse me. Um, so, so what we did was kind of customize this job to where the welder, um, I'm sorry, the, the veteran could get the blueprints gathered for the various workstations that day um, and could also set up the stations because this person had experience welding. So they could read a blueprint and know what that station needed depending on the different projects that they were working on. That person could also do inventory and do some restocking which freed up the business owner to do the accounting because he was kind of frustrated, didn't want to hire an accounting firm to, to do his accounting. So, um, so it was kind of a, a great situation. Um, you know, the veteran now is in an environment that he wanted to be in. You know, he's, he's with people who speak his language um, and the employer has an employee that's filling um, a role that he hadn't thought about before in terms of breaking the, breaking things down into a customized way. Another form of customized employment, um, and this is kind of a similar example, um, is a job negotiation. Um, however, with a job negotiation, a job description is one in which all the tasks of the work setting are looked at. So before we kind of only looked at a few tasks, but when you do job negotiation, you look at all the tasks in the work setting and see if a new job description can be developed by looking at all the job descriptions, all the tasks that need to be get done, that need to be get, that need to get done, thank you. Um, that aren't, again, for, for whatever reason. Um, and this could include not only tasks that aren't getting done, but um, also new tasks. Um, one of the things that happens sometimes when you're meeting with an employer is as you're, you're talking to them, whether it's informational interview or just in a you know, casual chit chat, um, you might hear an employer say, man, I really wish I had somebody to come in once a week and do A, B, and C, but, you know, I, that's a pipe dream that's never going to happen. And you as an employment professional are kind of taking that down either in your notes or, you know, in the back of your mind mentally, because as you're thinking about a possible job negotiation, you might be able to offer that something that the employer wasn't able to accomplish to the employer, which creates more of a win-win a so that the new job de description reflects um, the new negotiated tasks including some of the ones that maybe weren't getting met before. So the next slide shows an example of that um, with a warehouse associate. So in this situation, two different things needed to be negotiated. The first was the person's schedule, their, their hours a little bit, and then next was the actual job description. So in terms of the schedule, this individual was taking public transportation, and the the warehouse every all the workers went in at eight o'clock his public transportation got him there at 8 45. and what we did is we worked out a different schedule where he shortened one of his breaks by 15 minutes so that brought it down to a half hour and then he stayed a half hour later every day so he was still able to meet the hours meet his tasks and assignments um, he, he just, you know, had those hours negotiated a, a small amount. And then the other part was the job description. So this was somebody who worked um, in the warehouse that put UCP codes on stock when the stock came in and then entered those codes into the computer so that inventory, everything matched up. And then he distributed the inventory throughout the warehouse, or that's what this position was supposed to do. And we had somebody who was interested in this position, but had a tough time with um, big open areas um, and, and loud, big open spaces that, you know, had some loud noises going on. So what we did was negotiated to where this person put the codes on 
put the codes in the computer also picked up more of the um, of the inventory duties that took place in the in the office area, not out on the warehouse floor, so that he could stay in a more quiet area. The stock room there was quiet, and um, somebody else picked up more of the distributing uh, product throughout the warehouse. So that was an example of a negotiated job. These all kind of fall under customized employment. Um, the next is restructuring the environment, um, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, as we mentioned before, it could be offering flexible um, schedules. We know that for almost every functional limitation, there is an accommodation available um, to either minimize it or remove it. Um, so things like providing checklists for a person um, who, who maybe um, needs a, a visual prompts to make sure that they're getting through their list of what they're supposed to do. Um, written or pictorial instructions. Um, and I actually find pictorials you know, easy myself. Um, so, so that's a possibility. Um, minimizing clutter, you know, if, if somebody has an, um, some type of ambulatory um, situation going on, just, you know, making sure there's not a, a lot of clutter around. Um, color coding items, also one of my favorites. Um, my calendar is color coded, um, my closet <laughs> is color coded, and I'm probably telling you too much about myself. Um, you can also divide large tasks into multiple smaller tasks. That's actually something that we in the field call task analysis. Um, and it's just a way to kind of break things down. So when you're looking at a task that just seems too big, if we break it into smaller tasks, uh, it makes it easier um, for a person to accomplish. And then also giving um, positive feedback. Some other ones that aren't on here um, that I thought about is providing um, more frequent breaks. So let's say people get a break in the morning, that's 15 minutes, you know, somebody could split that up into two seven and a half minute breaks um, if that helps them. Uh, an anti-fatigue mat at somebody's workstation, um, you know, if, if they have lower back issues. Um, for the past hour, I was using my standing desk, um, which I then lowered so that I would be close enough to my computer um, for you all to hear me. But that really helps when my back is acting up. Um, so, so there are lots of things and really it's all considered universal design. Um, yeah, a, a good example is curb cuts, right? Why were curb cuts um, started? It was because of the Americans with Disabilities Act. How many people without disabilities use curb cuts okay i travel a lot i use them all the time because i'm pulling my wheeled um, suitcase behind me um, individuals who are pushing baby carriages um, use them all the time so a lot of these are con considered universal and they help not only the one employee that you're working with but they help pretty much everybody um, so either by raising a hand or by typing in the box, I would love to um, ask if anybody could think of any others. Um, you know, like I mentioned, I have the standing desk. Um, anything that either you've um, used in the past or something that you can think of or that others you know use um, that basically just restructure things so that a person can still be productive. And I'll give you a few minutes and hope that I haven't bored you and that you're there listening and uh, Corey will hopefully have some. Yeah, uh, so folks can uh, pop questions right into that uh, the box. Of course, feel free to raise your hands as well. Um, <clears throat> while folks are doing that, uh, Nancy, I did want to share uh, that uh, Gabriel uh, made an observation in a past position that he worked in. Uh, uh, this was in response to a lot of when you were talking about task negotiation. Um, uh, he, he said it, they'd often ask employers what what tasks they had to do that kept them from making money, which I thought was a, just a great way to uh, to bottom line it. Like, what are you doing that's distracting you from from what you should be doing? I, I, so, good observation from Gabriel there, and we'll keep our eye out for additional thoughts on accommodations and universal design. 
Great, and thanks for that, Gabriel. That is, you know, that's a, a perfect way just to get to the employer's bottom line. All right, so we'll move on now to job creation. Um, and job creation is a, um, where we create a job description that's negotiated based on the unmet needs in the employer's workplace. So some of these kind of sound familiar, but I'm hoping that the examples that I'm giving you, um, you know, shed a little bit light on how they're a little bit different. So what this can do is lead to a new job description based on the unmet needs um, of the employment setting, or um, it could even be based on the self-employment self business um, that a person has, has chosen. So what do we mean by that? Um, it's, it's looking at unmet needs. So it's, it's not something that was in the job description before. Um, and I, I literally did not think of this until I was putting this presentation together. And I was like, wow, when I was, I think 14 or 15, I had a job created for me. And I was working at uh, Carvel Ice Cream and it was in kind of a strip mall plaza and I didn't necessarily like the job anymore. Um, so I just started going to the other stores in the strip mall and asked if anybody was hiring or needed anybody. Um, and I went to this one store called Tucker's, which was a high end um, kind of a lingerie shop for um, for women who had maybe been through surgeries and needed undergarments that were then um, uh, tailored to, to them. So when she told me that that's what they did at the store, I was like, all right, thanks, you know, and, you know, obviously not qualified to do that, I'm only 15. Um, and as I was walking out, one of the um, coworkers heard me and said, yeah, but she could do the tagging in the back. And Mrs. Tucker was like, oh, and she was like, follow me. And she took me into their back stock room and she said, all of those boxes, we have to empty them out. We have to put them on tags and we have to put them, we have to use the tagging thing. I forget what it's called now and, and put them on hangers. So, and then put them out on the floor. I'm like, well, I could do that. So, so they created that position for me. And the women who worked there loved me because I was taking away a part of their job that they didn't like to do. And for me, sitting in a room, just tagging and putting things on hangers was fine. You know, this was just a part time after school, you know, making some money. Um, so it worked out perfect. And and I didn't even plan on it. So I also have um, another example on the next page. And this was um, uh, something that we did for a small legal office, actually, in, in St. Augustine, Florida. So we met with an employer. Um, their filing was not getting done. Their shredding was not getting done. Um, this goes back a while because do people still shred? I guess they still do. Um, and it was causing problems for the legal office. Um, it was PII problems, personally identifical information, because those the filing wasn't getting done. Files were sitting out with people's information. The shredding wasn't getting done. And the reason they weren't um, getting done those tasks is they didn't have anybody to do them other than the, the lawyers who wanted to concentrate on billable hours because billable hours is how they were rated in, in terms of production. So nobody wanted to do any of the non-billable responsibilities. So we helped get somebody hired there part-time who did the filing, did the shredding, and it allowed those individuals, other individuals to focus on their billable hours. So it was, it, it filled a great need for us because we had somebody who wanted to work in an office environment and it worked out well for the business because her people were um, getting in more billable hours. So, the universal hiring rule. Understanding the universal hiring rule is really the key to facilitating a customized employment match. We must demonstrate 
that the value of hiring the individual is greater than the cost to the business in terms of making good business sense. So um, Rebecca touched on that a little bit earlier. So in other words, the candidate is the solution. So going back to what I was just talking about with, um, with the, the legal firm, the, the small law office, right? Yes, she brought on a new part-time person to do the filing and the shredding, but the billable hours picked up a little bit from her other employees. So it was, it was simply a win-win. Um, and that's what we have to remember is that we would never propose something to an employer that doesn't put the candidate in the best light and show the employer that the candidate is the solution to their problems. Um, so I just want to um, read this quote to you because I really like it. It's from Martina Navratilova and it says, disability is a matter of perception. If you can do just one thing well, you're needed by someone. And we can go on to the next slide. So when we talk about voluntary negotiations, and remember everything that we're talking about here is, is voluntary. Um, what that involves includes setting up a meeting to present a job proposal to an employer Okay, and it must include the tasks that the employer recognizes as adding value, as we've already talked about. The employer may accept the proposal. Hopefully they will. Hopefully you've built a relationship. You've gotten to know their business well enough. They've gotten to know your candidate well enough um, and their proposal is accepted. It may be that partial proposal is accepted and the employer, the employee, and you kind of talk about some negotiations. Um, or the employer can reject it, and that's okay. Um, you know, there, there can be many re rejections, you know, as, as we're doing job seeking for folks. I think we all know that. But one of the other things that's interesting that can come out of this is, you know, the employer could say, this, this just isn't going to work for me, but... Um, you know, I've got a buddy at Ace Hardware who I, you know, I think this position would be perfect for him. He's been looking for somebody, you know, to, to fill this role. So, so you can also look at it that way, that you're meeting with employers who, even if they can't assist you, can link you to others who can. So let's go on to talking about um, on the job supports. Corey, I, um, I think you guys are gonna be talking about that um, a little later on after this. So um, hopefully the, the two will, will complement one another. Uh, so on the job supports include activities and relationships that can help a person maintain their job. Um, ongoing supports is a frequent feature um, of customized employment and it's really a unique feature of customized employment that makes it possible for people with barriers to sustain employment over time. And on the job supports, um, they can come from a variety of sources. So it could be a coworker um, who helps somebody a little bit more on the job. It could be a supervisor who typically that's their, their role anyway. Um, it could actually happen off of the job site in terms of um, getting support from family members and peers. So, you know, we call these natural supports and really they can aid in job retention by fostering support that may be critical to certain individuals who need that extra level of support on the job. Um, and we know that we can't be there to do that. Um, in addition to natural supports that can be developed in the workplace, like I said, family members, friends, any other support providers um, can really help improve job retention through maybe providing transportation. Possibly somebody needs a personal care assistant on the job. Maybe there's other supports that are necessary. We need to make sure that somebody's um, going to their mental health um, therapy meetings, whatever it may be. So it, it kind of is a, a, a group effort when we're looking at on the job supports. What is this person going to need? And let me make sure that I get those set up 
as the person is starting their job. So we can hopefully um, find a higher level of success on that job. So according to the Americans with Disabilities Act, there are many questions to consider when, we're, when determining reasonable accommodations. And you'll see some that we have here. What barriers does the employer, I'm sorry, employee experience? And how do these affect the employee and their job performance? Um, so going back to my standing desk, perfect example. I, I can't sit for too long. I do have to stand up. If I'm on a phone call, that's okay because I can actually walk and listen. But if I have to be in front of the computer, then my standing desk allows me to stand while still looking at the computer, therefore keeping up my job performance. Um, we also look at what job tasks might be problematic. So it could be that somebody's doing fine on their job, it's just one or two tasks that maybe we need to look at and see if an accommodation is needed there. Um, and then we always say, well, what's available um, to reduce or eliminate these barriers? Um, sometimes they're super simple. In fact, most often than not, they're simple. Um, and then are all possible resources being used to determine what those supports are? Um, and then can the employee provide information on possible accommodation solutions? People, individuals with disabilities, are th they know the most about themselves and they've learned how to overcome things. So sometimes we just need help to get them to understand how to transition that uh, into the employment um, situation. And then once we do put those accommodations and supports into place, are they effective? Are, are they working for the person? Um, do we need additional accommodations? And then the next thing I'm going to talk about is post-employment supports. And when I say post-employment, I don't mean after the job is over. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's when the job is found and, and going well, and we want to retain the job. So post-employment supports have really proven to be beneficial for people with barriers to employment who may encounter issues that they may not be able to, they may not be prepared to handle. Um, and so some of those supports um, are a proactive approach to job retention um, that can that can help um, putting those employment supports in place to help promote satisfaction of both the job seeker and the employer because remember we do have more than one customer in this situation uh, the supports help identify some of those resources we talked about earlier um, if any renegotiation is needed uh, we make sure that there's supports put in place for that and we like to get continuous feedback on how things are going um, so that we don't all of a sudden get a call from an employer that there's a really big problem because we've been getting continuous feedback all along and we've been making adjustments to those supports um, and services as needed. So a little bit about reasonable accommodations. I'm sure you all are familiar um, with the US Department of Labor's Job Accommodation Network. Um, we call JAN. JAN is a, a great resource. Um, so first of all, they report that accommodations are very low cost, less than $500. And in half the cases, there is no cost to the accommodation at all. So let's say somebody's desk needs to be repositioned so, so that their back doesn't um, face other people, right? And it's just a matter of shifting the direction of the desk. That's a reasonable accommodation and it didn't cost anything. Um, I also wanna let you know that they're really good at answering specific questions and you can go on to their website and look at, um, they actually have disabilities from A to Z. You could, you could pick by disability um, and how to accommodate certain folks that have those types of disabilities. You can also ask them um, about certain things that are happening on the job and see if they have any advice or ideas or solutions. 
um, for that accommodation. So they're, they're really good, <clears throat> excuse me. And then businesses are also eligible for tax credits um, that cover the cost of some of those accommodations for, <clears throat> excuse me, individuals with disabilities. I'm gonna take a quick sip of water. And I wanna to provide to you a website that I don't, that I didn't put up here. And it's ada.gov forward slash tax cred. And that's where an employer can go and just find out information on what tax credits might be available to them to provide accommodations that maybe cost more than the F than average. So another question for y'all. We asked this last week, but we wanted to ask it again. Any more thoughts on how your job has been customized now that we've talked about all the different ways that jobs can be customized? Um, I know I shared a couple examples of how my, um, my job has been customized. So can anybody think of any others? While folks are, and just a reminder, folks can raise their hands or they can drop information into the question box. While folks are doing that, um, when you'd asked previously uh, about accommodations and uh, adjustments, modifications to job tasks, that kind of thing, Nancy, I got a really great uh, point from David that I wanted to bring up with you and just, just have you talk about it just a bit, and then we'll get other uh, responses as well. So what David says is, I think when we're talking about accommodations and modifications for veterans, we need to help the veteran be able to discuss this with coworkers. For example, in the warehouse example, modifications can cause a cultural divide. I think it can be difficult for the veteran to be able to manage those discussions. Most employees in those kinds of environments, like warehouses, are held to the clock. When they see another employee not having to meet those same demands, it can cause difficulties for the veteran. So uh, before we jump back to your more recent question, could, uh, could you or Rebecca just address that a bit in terms of how we equip folks for talking about those issues on a work site? Sure, I'll, I'll start and then, um, you know, certainly I'm sure Rebecca's got some ideas as well. So um, one of the things that we recommend depending on depending on the size of a company, depending on the environment, is maybe we do a little disability sensitivity. Um, certainly if the person is, um, is, is revealing that they have a disability and is okay with this. Um, you know, maybe a little bit on just, you know, diversity in, in the workplace, um, which is happening in a lot of workplaces now anyway, I think as cultures are changing, especially more, more recently, um, there, there's a lot more talk going on about diversity in various ways. Um, so, so that could be something that could take place. The, the, the point that the gentleman brought up is, is spot on. Um, and sometimes folks that you know are on a little bit of a different schedule or that are doing things a little bit differently, um, you know, it, it can kind of stick out and it could upset other people who might want to say, hey, I wish I could come in at 845 too. Um, but once folks know that there's a reason behind it and that they're still doing their due diligence in terms of working their shift and doing whatever possible to, um, to meet the employer's needs, um, I think some of those can, can get balanced out. And hi, it's Rebecca. I mean, I, I agree with that. And it, it's such a good question and a good point. And, you know, in the same way that many other universal designs make things better for everyone, sometimes creating those accommodations create new dialogues for people so that, that it's possible that there are other people who would be more productive if they had a little flexibility. I know that there are workplaces where they have created graphic organizers or used pictures to label things for people. And the response to that from other people who didn't need that accommodation is that it's making their job easier and that they really appreciate it. And, and instructions are a lot more clear if you have to accommodate someone who needs really specific instructions. But, you know, it, it's, uh, 
sometimes it, it is an opportunity, as Nancy said, you know, whether or not you call it disability sensitivity or not, but it's it's not a bad way to get a discussion started so that there might be little things that will reduce turnover for other people also if um, and, and increase satisfaction if those accommodations can be can be made. So it, it really uh, very often makes workplaces better for everyone when people start to, to have those discussions. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. And um, as you were saying that, um, I thought of a, a, a warehouse situation. I have worked in plenty of warehouses um, in my day as, as a job coach. Um, this was a marine supply warehouse that I was working in, and I was um, it was in my supported employment days, and I was assisting um, a person that got hired as a porter. And this warehouse was huge, and um, this gentleman was only responsible for a certain number of aisles where he would go pick up um, boxes, break them down, and then put them into a baler. And he was having trouble remembering which aisles were his because this place was so large. So I asked um, the employer if I could hang up like poster board at the end of the aisle um, with a big X. I just took black um, electrical tape or whatever it is and I made an X on, um, on some big pieces of poster board and I hung them at the end of um, the aisles that this gentleman worked with. So everything was fine. And then, I don't know, I think about three weeks went by and somebody said to me, that is great. He said, the, those aisles that have those markings, I have less guys with the forklift cutting the corner too short <laughs> because they see that. And they're like, I'd really like to have that on all of our, the ends of all the aisles. And I was like, well, please don't <laughs> because that's gonna mess my game up. But um, it, it's amazing how sometimes the things that we put in place um, wind up working better for um, others in the environment as well. And Corey, I don't know if we had anything else come in or if you just want me to continue on. Well, I um, did get one, uh, and this is, uh, I guess this is a kind of customization that we are all experiencing right now, but uh, David, again, actually uh, mentioned that uh, working remotely has definitely been a, a feature of customization in his experience recently. So I'm sure a lot of folks in the audience can identify with that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, I... I am a, a teleworker, um, but I, I, I know some people who are really struggling. Um, a friend of mine that um, lives in Tampa called me one day and she said, I just don't know how you do this. She, she was going stir crazy at home where, you know, to me, it's something that I'm used to. Um, but, you know, not everybody adjusts to every situation. All right, so moving on. So these are the three videos that um, Rose mentioned that are coming soon. So we're very excited for them. Rose, do you um, do you want to talk about them at all? Any mention? Um, I, I think I talked about them enough at the beginning, okay. but Great. as a reminder, there's two videos and one brief. Beautiful. We're looking forward to those um, coming out. And then so on our final slide, we have um, some resources for you that we that we think would um, be helpful and kind of complement the materials that we've been um, covering last week and this week. Um, the first is the Customized Employment Systems Innovation Brief um, about implementing customized employment, guided group discovery, and self-guided discovery in a variety of settings with a variety of partners. So that could be helpful to folks that are on this um, webinar. We also have a great information brief on customized employment and guided group discovery. And then the third resource is the essential elements of customized employment for universal application. Both um, Rebecca and I talked about universal application throughout last week's presentation, as well as this one. So that gives you a little more information there. 
Um, and having said that, it uh, looks like we've got a few minutes for any questions and answers. So uh, Corey, thank you very much. And everybody out there, thank you very much for your time. And I will pass it back over to you. Okay, so just so folks know, I am putting those uh, the hyperlinks uh, into the chat box, so folks will have access to those as well. Uh, also, the uh, the videos and briefs that that Rose mentioned that we uh, that that will be coming out. We are, if the timing works out, we will include that in the next NVTAC newsletter that comes out, so folks should be able to access those there. Um, if I, if they're not out in time, then we'll we'll just send it out in whatever the next newsletter will be. And of course, uh, folks can, if you have questions, comments, anything to that effect, please do let us know. Where uh, we will, folks are still here to answer those and let us know what you think. And Corey, it's Rebecca. You know that the question or the comment that came in before that asking an employer what was keeping them from making money. Um, you know, uh, th those are great questions to have in your back pocket as you're doing informational interviews with employers. Um, a colleague used to ask people if they had an assistant for a few hours a day in their organization, what would they have them do? And people immediately come up with a whole list of things that aren't being done, you know, as was the case in, in Nancy's example of the person who formerly was a welder, you know, that there are always things, especially as the economy shifts and there are reorganizations, that there are things that people forgot about that somebody used to do. But but every once in a while, it's in the back of their mind. So having those kind of questions, um, you know, is, is just a, a really good thing. And I really especially like, like that one. I, I also wanted to say that, you know, one of the things that I love about customized employment is that it turns everyone into a job developer. But once you start thinking that way, it's hard to walk into any business and not notice that there are, you know, a wall of boxes of filing that nobody is doing that, that you know, might be a need. And, and it really does turn people into someone who starts having that discussion you know, whose job is that? Or, and then when they say, well, obviously nobody, you know, it be, can become a discussion of, you know, I know someone who has wonderful organizational skills and really would like to work in the healthcare setting or those kinds of things. But it really does start to change your lens as you're out and about and just talking to people that you know or entering businesses or restaurants or shopping malls. It, uh, it creates all kinds of, of opportunities. So it's, um, it, it's really a wonderful approach. And especially if you are using discovery and you know certain things about people that you know would be a good fit for them, you start making those connections in your head. Are there any questions that came in, Corey? Well, I, Sharon did ask if there, uh, if these materials will be available after the fact. Uh, so we did, in addition to the materials uh, on the slide, I also posted in the chat to everyone that um, uh, the link to our archive sessions on the nvtech.org uh, website, so you can actually go go back through the entire series in addition to the two sessions by uh, Nancy and Rebecca. Um, and we have a hand up. So Mr. Williams uh, has a hand up. So I will go ahead and unmute your line. Mr. Williams, can you hear us? Oh, that might have been a, a mistaken hand raise there. So, uh, but again, folks, any questions, comments, please do feel free to direct them our way. We'd love to hear it. And on the slide with the two videos and the brief that ODEP will be releasing shortly, those are links to where they're going to live. So, um, so those are live links as well. There's there's a placeholder on the on the website. Um, so I think Rose thinks that the brief is going to be posted this week, um, and the videos shortly thereafter. So those are those are the links that you will be able to access them at. All right. 
Excellent. So I will drop those into the chat box as well for folks. Great. And then this is right around the time, usually uh, 10 to 15 minutes after the hour that we um, uh, close up shop on these. We will, of course, leave the line open until at least quarter after so folks can continue to ask any questions. Um, uh, and, um, and feel free to interact. So we'll keep the line open. But if folks do have other things they need to get to, of course, they're welcome to sign off as well. But And thank you again on behalf of uh, the good folks at ODEP and the WIOA Center and uh, Nancy and Rebecca, we really appreciate your dialing on today and we really appreciate the interactivity. Uh, and we look forward to, we will ha be having one more session. Uh, again, our scheduling got kind of strange because we've got so many things on the calendar uh, recently, but uh, we do have one last session on Monday uh, afternoon or morning, depending on your time zone. So the GoToWebinar system will be reminding you about that, but please do tune in for that. We'll look forward to talking to you then. And otherwise, thank you all again. So thanks again to everyone. Uh, thank you again to Rebecca and Nancy and to everyone who dialed on. We'll be closing up shop now, but uh, we look forward to hearing from you. And please drop us a line at contact at nvtac.org if you have any further follow-up questions. Thank you. Thanks, Corey.